Hello, I'm Mark French, and this is a lecture from my honors class in the history of aerospace technology. If uh, you found this video by just clicking around uh, on YouTube, welcome. I'm glad you've decided to listen. So I'm going to do this in three segments. The first is let's talk a little bit about how jet engines work. Uh, not everybody listening to this is going to know how jet engines work, and so it's good to start there. The good news is that jet engines in concept aren't very hard. There's not very many parts in them and the, the basics of their operations are pretty simple. You don't have to be an engineer or a physicist or anything to figure it out. Second, I want to talk about uh, the engines designed by Sir Frank Whittle and Hans von Ohain, the, the two pioneers of jet engines. Then I'd like to move on to the first three workable jet aircraft. The first is the Gloucester E2839, which you can see here on the screen. The second one is the Heinkel 178 from Germany. The third, and certainly the most forgettable of the three, is the Bell P-59 from the U.S. Okay, here's a cutaway uh, diagram of a jet engine off Wikipedia. And the first thing to remember about jet engines is they're basically like any other kind of engines. Engines are basically just air pumps. If you want a lot of power out of an engine, you have to move a lot of air through it. And uh, the more air you put through it, the more fuel you can put through it. That's where the chemical energy comes from. And uh, engines work by compressing air, ignite, uh, squirting in fuel and igniting it, and then letting the expanded air out somehow. Piston engines work that way and jet engines work that way. So here's the three stages in any jet engine. If you look right here, this part that's kind of blue, that's the compressor stage. These are fans, and they, they're, they're just fans. They're very sophisticated fans. But in concept, they're not that much different than the box fan you might have at home or in your office. This part right here, where you can see the fire, that's not too surprising. That's where the, the combustor, that's where fuel is injected into the air after it gets compressed by all these fan stages. Gets, uh, fuel is injected in, and it gets lit. So it burns there, and then it expands out the back, making thrust. Well, it does, the, the expanding uh, hot gas does two things. It makes thrust that goes out the back, which is what uh, propels the plane. But see these things right here? These are also fans, only instead of driving the air, they are driven by the exhaust gas. This is the turbine stage. And when the turbine stage is connected to the compressor stage by the shaft in the middle here, you can see they've even got it uh, marked here, so it's turning. So the compressor turns when the turbine is driven by the exhaust gas that goes out the back. Some of the energy from the exhaust gases is dissipated by the turbine stage as it runs the compressor. You know, it takes energy to run this thing. That energy has to come from somewhere. It comes from here. But the part that you don't use to run the compressor run, goes out the back as thrust. That's what makes the airplane move. That's what provides the thrust that propels the airplane forward. Now there are basically two kinds of jet engines. The first one, and the one we see almost exclusively now, is called an axial flow. It means that the flow of the air moving through the engine goes down the axis. Here's the, the center axis is right there. And the air always moves down the axis of the engine. That's called an axial flow. Okay, here's the other kind of jet engine. This is called a centrifugal flow engine. This is also a picture off Wikipedia. And it, rather than the air moving down the axis of the engine, it hits this compressor right here, and the compressed air now comes out the side. That's where this, the word centrifugal uh, is applied here. It gets compressed going through this right in here. They don't really show it very well, but that's where the uh, uh, combustion air would be. And then here's the turbine stage that runs the centrifugal compressor. Now, why would you want to use a centrifugal rather than an axial compressor? Well, the answer has to do with what's called the pressure ratio. As air moves through either an axial or centrifugal compressor, it gets compressed, as the name suggests. The more you can compress the air, the more thrust you can make. Well, a centrifugal stage, uh, like you see here, has a pressure ratio of cost of around 3 to 1. You get about three times the pressure on this side as you do on this side. An axial compressor is more like 1.2, 1.3, maybe somewhere in that neighborhood to 1. So if you want a high compression ratio going through the engine for an axial engine, you're going to need a lot of stages. So if I counted right, there's 17 stages in this one. 
and uh, that's not too unusual. This little diagram only has one. Um, the reason it's hard to put multiple stages using centrifugal, centrifugal compressors is that the air has to go in in the center and come out on the edge. Well, if you want to put another stage back here, another centrifugal stage, you've got to now somehow duck the air back to the center and out the edge again. That's hard to do. Modern engines sometimes have centrifugal stages in them. Turboprop engines often do. But it's not usually the only stage. Sometimes there'll be like a hybrid engine that has a couple of axial stages up here ending in a centrifugal stage. That's not too uncommon with turboprops. Now I just mentioned turboprops. There's actually a couple of kinds of jet engines. And what we're going to be talking about in here is just a straight turbojet. But there are uh, other types of engines. There's one called a turbofan. There's one called a turboprop, and there's one called a turbo shaft. Well, since I brought it up, I guess we might as well take a minute and figure out what all these are. Let's go back to our axial flow turbojet. Okay, this is a jet engine, uh, like you see in a lot of airplanes, but this isn't very good at low speed. For mechanical reasons, it turns out that it's better to, at low speed, to accelerate a lot of air a little bit than a little air a lot. It uh, is mechanically more efficient. Well, airliners, for example, fly at low speed a lot of the time. They take off, they land. When they cruise, they're cruising at high subsonic speeds sometimes, but they spend a lot of their time at relatively low speeds. So you want an engine that's tailored for low speeds. Turbojets, like you see here, aren't. They're happier at high speeds. Okay, now here's a picture of a turbofan. This is a, a very popular one called a CF6. This has to be a company picture because there's a guy standing there looking very earnest with a clipboard and a company jacket on. Anyway, that's fine. This big fan you see on the front is basically just another uh, compressor stage hooked to the front of the compressor stages that are already there. But it has one difference. Rather than the fan air all going through the rest of the engine, which is now called a core, most of it goes around the outside of the engine. That's called bypass air. So if you ever heard something called a high bypass turbofan, this is a high bypass turbofan. Almost all airliners use high bypass turbofans. And so oftentimes you'll see this big cowling with what looks like the jet engine sticking out the back of it. That's exactly what it is. The big cowling goes around the fan and the uh, rest of the jet engine sticks out the back. Okay, here's what a turbofan engine looks like when it's mounted on a plane. This is a uh, Boeing 777, uh, obviously owned by British Airways. See this giant cowling right there? That part is designed to fit around the fan. That's, that covers the fan stage, and that directs the fan air, the bypass air, out the back of the engine. This little part that sticks back here, that's the jet engine core. That's making the, the, that's the hot air uh, that gets uh, exhausted out the back. So that's what a, a uh, turbo fan looks like. The diameter is really large, so they don't do real, real well at super high speeds. Now, I also mentioned there's a thing called a turboprop. Well, this is what a turboprop looks like. This bit right here is a jet engine. This is just a turbojet, nothing but that, just like we saw before. Instead of all the energy going out the back in the form of hot gas, there's another way to extract power from this, this jet engine core here. See the shaft right here? This shaft is just stuck to the same shaft that has the uh, compressors on it. And it goes through this gearbox here. This is basically a transmission. Because remember, this, this shaft is turning very, very quickly. The thousands and thousands of RPMs usually. See this propeller up here? Propellers are really big and they like to turn slow. So if you want to move a whole lot of air but not accelerate it very much, there's nothing better than a propeller. If you want a plane that has the uh, power and the light weight of a jet engine, but the low speed efficiency of a propeller, this is the deal. It's called a turboprop. It's a turbo jet hooked through a transmission to a propeller. I'm not completely sure what that is, whether that's a starter or a generator or something like that, but that's an accessory to the engine. If you've ever flown a commuter airliner that's a turboprop, uh, they use an engine that looks just about like this. Military transports like C-130s also use them. Okay, the last kind of engine I mentioned was a turbo shaft, and it's kind of like a turboprop. It's basically just a jet engine. Here's one right here called the General Electric T-58. It gets used on all kinds of helicopters. 
There's a jet engine right there. This should look pretty familiar now. There's fan or uh, compressor stages there. There's the combustor, and there's the turbine stages right there. Now, see that big exhaust duct? It's pointed out at an angle, so it's pretty clear that exhaust isn't meant to power anything. It's just getting dumped. See this bit right here? On a turboprop, that would go to a propeller. Well, a turbo shaft, that's now just a drive shaft. That drive shaft is like the drive shaft coming out of any other engine, and you can run just about anything with it. You power helicopters with it. T-58 was, uh, has been around for a long time now, I think around 50 years, and it got used on all different kinds of helicopters. Here's the thing, you can kind of see it on this, uh, this card right here. It makes about 1,250 horsepower, which is about 930 kilowatts, I think. It only weighs about 250 pounds, so it weighs like uh, 110, 120 kilograms. This thing is light and it's small. Here's another picture from the Wikipedia page that I got this uh, from. Looks like this might be on an aircraft carrier or something. See the U.S. Navy patch on the guy's uh, pocket right there. Look how big this thing is. There's the shaft coming out the uh, drive shaft. Uh, there's the exhaust that goes around it. The, the drive shaft actually comes out of the back on this model. So this thing is not very big. It's tiny and it makes a lot of power, so it's a great engine. It's simple. There's a bunch of stuff on here that makes it look complicated. But there are very few moving parts on this engine. Turbine engines are pretty reliable. So there's the three kinds of engines or four kinds we're worried about. is the turbojet, turbofan, turboprop, and turboshaft. So let's just focus now on the turbojet engine. It's the simplest of the four, and it was the first one to be developed. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, the, the two people who really developed the jet engine in the early days were Sir Frank Whittle. He wasn't Sir Frank at that point. And a German uh, scientist named Hans von Ohain. Whittle obviously worked in England, and von Ohain worked in Germany. And they worked independently of one another. They were not collaborators in any way. Uh, they may have known what each other were doing, but their, the designs they made were very, very different. Um, I just love that the best picture I can find on the internet of the early Whittle engine is a painting, not a photograph, but here it is. And it shows what we need to see here. This is a young Frank Whittle uh, with a control of a panel right here, a very simple one. And there's the engine. Um, that right there is just exactly what it looks like. That's a centrifugal compressor. And this giant coiled thing that comes around here is the output from the centrifugal compressor. It comes out at one point, and right about there, I think, is probably the combustor. This comes back down and dumps into that thing, which is the turbine, and the jet exhaust goes out the back, which I love is just stuck out a window somewhere. Uh, I hope this is at least on the second floor. I don't know how they kept people from walking past that window. A good while back now, I got to listen to a talk at the Air Force Museum. There was a joint talk between Frank Whittle and Hans von Ohain, and it was just absolutely a delight. One of the things they did uh, very differently from each other is Whittle decided to run his engine on uh, kerosene, on jet fuel, right from the get-go. And so he spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to solve combustion problems. Von Ohain started with hydrogen. Hydrogen is extremely volatile and it's hard to get it to not burn. So he figured if he did that, he could focus on the engine and not have to worry about combustion. Combustion would just happen. It was going to be easy to sustain combustion. So here's a cutaway of one of the early Whittle jet engines. He formed a company called Power Jets, and this is a cutaway from one of his uh, the company drawings. And this doesn't look much like we would expect a jet engine to look now. This doesn't look like a modern jet engine very much, and the reason is that it has a single centrifugal stage in it. The flow through the engine is pretty complicated, and when you walk up to one, it's kind of hard to tell like where the air comes in and where the exhaust gas goes out. Let me maybe steer you through this. You can see right here that this is a centrifugal fan. and it, You can't, can't really see here, but it's got two faces on it. Air comes in through this screen and goes into the centrifugal fan. It goes in at the center and it comes out at the edge. Well, you can kind of see here that there's blades on two sides. And you see the screen there? Air actually comes in and hits both sides of that centrifugal fan. But it has to come out the edge. So how do you get it from the edge back in through a turbine. 
What Whittle decided to do was rather than have one large combustion can coming off one spot on the edge of the uh, centrifugal fan, he'd have a bunch of little ones. I'm not sure how many are on this one. You'd have to look it up. But there are all these separate combustor cans uh, situated around the engine. And so you can kind of see here, the air flows out from the edge of the, comp the centrifugal compressor, goes in there, comes back through here, there's, you see all these vents and everything. That thing right there is a fuel injector, so it injects fuel in there, burns in this combustor, and then gets ducted back around through the turbine there and comes out the back. So let's see, the air goes in the front, out the side, towards the back, turns around, does 180 degrees through the, compre or the combustor, and then does another 180 degrees th to get out through the turbine. You can see the turbine stages right there. So the good news is this engine is pretty short. The bad news is it has a very large diameter. Well, airplanes like to be long and skinny to get through the air uh, easily, to have a low drag coefficient. And this thing is like trying to, to wedge an oil barrel into it. All right, here, let's move to Germany now. This is an engine developed by Hans von Ohain in, when he was working for Heinkel. It's called an HES-3. And it looks like this engine may have existed in a couple of different uh, models or configurations. This particular one is different than the Whittle engine uh, in that it has a uh, axial compressor in front of a centrifugal compressor. So there's an increase in pressure here before you go to the centrifugal stage. Um, it's not clear from this picture what the turbine stage looks like. From here, it looks like these that the turbine may be centrifugal. I don't, that sure doesn't look like an axial turbine. Uh, I'll have to find out though. This is a centrifugal flow engine uh, similar to the one that Whittle developed and that the British put into production. But the Germans gave up on centrifugal flow engines fairly quickly and went to axial flow engines. Okay, here's the best picture I could find on the web for the uh, Yumo 004. It's, it's called Junkers Yumo 004, and if you're American or English, it's J-U-N-K-E-R-S. It looks like it ought to be pronounced Junkers, but it's not. It's Junkers. And this is the engine that powered the ME-262. This isn't the very first engine that uh, Germany developed, but it's probably the one that uh, uh, saw the most use. and certainly was the only one that uh, went into combat in any numbers during World War II. It's pretty obvious that this is an axial flow engine. It looks like there's maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe eight compressor stages in this laughably staged photo. I just love this. You know, these staged photos always have somebody pointing at something, and then there's always somebody else uh, with a tablet or a, a clipboard or something very carefully writing something down. So uh, pretty obviously the air goes in this end goes through the compressor stages and there's going to be a, a, a combustor stage back here and then behind this young lady is where the turbine stage would be. Uh, this engine was uh, being examined at an American lab after World War II so I assume this one is a captured engine. The earliest American engines were essentially copies of Whittle engines um, like the British, like the Germans. We got away from centrifugal flow compressors and went to axial flow. This engine right here looks an awful lot like some of the early American designs that originated in the US. Okay, jet aircraft engines are only useful if there's a jet aircraft to power them with. Um, this is one of my just favorite airplanes ever. This is the Gloucester E2839. It's an unusual designation because it was an experimental airplane and I think might have been designated by the uh, contract number or something like that. It's a very simple airplane with straight wings. It has uh, retractable tricycle landing gear, which was a little unusual at the time. The first German aircraft, jet aircraft, had still had tailwheel landing gear, just like the pilots were used to at the time. Um, you can see the fuselage is kind of large because it has to fit around that centrifugal flow engine. You can see from the pilot here, this is a little airplane. This thing is not very big. It has the intake in the front, 
You can kind of see the exhaust back there. It's very small diameter compared to the diameter of the fuselage because they had to wedge that centrifugal flow engine in it. Now, this flew in 1941, so at the time the frontline fighter for the RAF was still the uh, Spitfire and the Hurricane. Uh, Spitfires at the time could fly about 350, 360 miles an hour, somewhere around 500 kilometers an hour. This plane was very significantly faster. It was 460 miles an hour or so, so up around 600 kilometers an hour. Uh, it could easily outrun the fastest fighters of the day. So this was a big step forward. This is clearly uh, where the British knew they wanted to go. Uh, they eventually wound up fielding a couple of jet fighters at the very end of World War II, although they saw very limited service. But this was a very successful little plane. All right, this is the first American jet aircraft of the era. This is the Bell P-59, which first flew in 1942. And uh, the United States was definitely behind England and Germany at this point. Uh, this plane had engines that were basically copies of Whittle engines and the airframe itself was adequate. It did have retractable tricycle gear and this was intended to be a you know, service military aircraft. It had uh, there's guns on some versions of it and they made a few of them. I think 66 of them were, being, were finally produced according to Wikipedia. The problem was that as a service aircraft this was kind of a stinker. It wasn't really any better than the piston engine fighters at the time it's probably inferior to a P-51 or P-38, so it was useful as a uh, experimental aircraft and uh, useful in getting some operational experience with jet aircraft, but it wasn't a successful operational plane. So while this was technically an operational aircraft, really it was an experimental aircraft and was useful for that. The first successful operational aircraft came later. Uh, the three you may run across are the Lockheed P-80, later called the F-80, and later turned into the T-33, a uh, Republic F-84, I think, and the Navy had an F-9 Panther from Grumman. So if you look those up, those are really the first aircraft that they were used by the U.S. military in combat, the first jet aircraft. So as we close here, let's take a look at the General Electric J-31 turbojet. This is the model they used in the Bell P-59 I just showed you, and there were two of them, one on each side. It's pretty clear that this is a direct uh, derivative of the Whittle engine. Note they've got a cover over the exhaust right there. If you were to take that cover off and look in it, you might be able to see a turbine back there. But the air goes in sort of on this end. There's, there's screens hiding behind all this stuff where the air goes in. This is where the air comes out of the centrifugal compressor in a bunch of these different these combustion cans. Goes in there, does that 180 we talked about, does another 180, and then through the uh, axial uh, turbine out the back. This was one of the few kind of centrifugal flow engines used by the U.S. There was one generation of centrifugal flow engines after this that got used in the F-80 and the F-9 Panther and some others. But we very quickly went to uh, axial flow engines, as did basically everybody else in the world. So by the time the uh, 1950s came to a close, almost all jet engines were axial flow. Axial flow engines are more streamlined. They have a smaller diameter, so they're easier to put inside a nice, sleek aircraft. And the combustor can go in line between the compressor and the turbine. You don't have to do all these crazy 180 turns because those are inefficient. So modern jet aircraft, whether they be turbofans or turbojet, almost all use axial flow compressors. And this, the combustors that were initially these cans, well, you, they used those for a while and then eventually moved to something called an annular combustor. It looks like a donut. So there's these individual cans were replaced by a rounded section that uh, doesn't have all those walls and things in it. So let's stop there. That's the beginning of the jet age. We've looked at the Whittle engines, early Von Ohain engine. We've looked at the first jet aircraft, the Gloucester E2839, the Heinkel 178, and the American Bell P-59. So I hope this is a good start and I hope you'll want to learn more.